Hello, and welcome to another episode of Just Played, where I talk about tabletop RPGs I've recently participated in as either a player or facilitator. I'm your host, Jim Crocker, and I've just played Odyssey Aquatica. It's by Tim Denis, published by Old Dog Games, and it's not a standalone game. It's a Paragon playset of 1960-era oceanographic pulp adventure. This is a little mini campaign. We haven't really given it a name or anything like that. I expect we're probably going to play something like half a dozen sessions of it that we're playing on the Story Games Discord, which is a a small Discord server I'm part of where mostly what we're doing is getting together to play uh, short runs of indie games, story games, that kind of stuff. We played on Friday afternoon, February 25th, this particular session. It was jimmed by Mikhail, who is the organizer of that Story Games Discord, who I've played a whole bunch of games with as both a player and a game master. So on to our characters. I was playing Lola Madrid and my area of research, which is what defines your character in this particular Paragon playset. In Paragon, you would normally be a hero that would have some kind of a, a heroic focus. In the case of Odyssey Aquatica, you define an area of research that you specialize in and you give it a fanciful name, uh, you know, like it would be like a, a book you're writing or a dissertation topic or something like that. So I'm Lola Madrid and my area of research is percussive maintenance, the art and science of mechanical repair. So I'm basically the mechanic and blue collar roustabout for our ship. We've also got Captain Nigel Haversham the third, Royal Navy retired, whose specialty is charismatic performance and science communication towards a better informed public. He's our resident Jacques Cousteau, Carl Sagan, science spokesperson. Patricia Langfield is the character who is researching the silent world, exploring the deepest depths. She's our theoretical biologist. And Jiminy Jones, her research topic is sharks, the mindset of an apex predator. So she's our hands-on, get-in-the-cage-and-in-the-water biologist. Our starting situation, Jiminy's player couldn't make it this session, so we started out with me, Patricia, and the captain. After making some choices to set up our boat, the Sagittario North, and define our unscrupulous professional rivals, we set out to tackle our first mission, which was rescuing some American sailors and scientists stuck in an ocean floor sea lab that had lost contact with the surface. Get into the game. Our opening scene was to introduce us to the Paragon system mechanics. It was the first time several of us had played, and this was our first session together. So this consisted of fighting a monsoon to make sure that nothing on the boat got wrecked as we weathered the storm. Paragon is set up to game out situations where you're working together, but you've also got a personal goal that might be in tension with what the others want, even as you're working towards the same broader goal. In Aegon, which is the original Paragon game, your classical Greek heroes who are going around Jason and the Argonauts style solving the problems of various islands, but also wanting to gain the most favor and attention from the gods. So Odyssey Aquatica calls that attention glory, just like Aegon does, but it frames it as media attention and your ultimate significance to the historical and scientific record, basically how impressive your Wikipedia entry is going to end up being by the time you retire. Everyone who passes whatever test they're facing gains glory, but whoever does the best, which is to say whoever notches the highest total on their dice, gets the maximum glory, which is typically equal to whatever the difficulty of the original check was, while everyone else who passed but didn't roll as high gets half that. If you blow it, if you miss the roll, get under the target number, you get a single point, and generally you suffer some consequences depending on the nature of the check. So in this case, we had to all scramble around the ship and try to weather this monsoon. Because it was the initial test, it would be used to determine who was officially in command of the expedition for the rest of the session, as opposed to dealing directly with the problem. So I used my repair specialty to improvise some tie-downs for the helicopter. The captain used his semaphore training to issue instructions to the crew over the howling winds, and Patricia ran to the engine room to help stabilize it. We all passed and got some glory. I rolled the highest, which meant I got the maximum, but I elected to put the captain in charge of the mission. So the ship's safe. We rolled on over to the Marianas Trench where the sea lab was located. It was deep enough that we needed full body pressure suits, like space suits, basically, as opposed to regular scuba gear. When we got down there, we saw a chunk of the base had been smashed, cleaving it in two. So after a contest to evade a giant mutant squid that we encountered down there blocking our path to the sea lab, we made contact with the U.S. Navy officer on the port side and entered. 
just as we received a flashed Morse code message from the starboard side that said not to trust them. So we get inside, and the captain that we encounter is paranoid and jittery, with several panicky-looking crewmen actually tied up and gagged, being watched over by other crew. Getting the crew to trust us and give over information is another contest that Nigel and I succeed at, but Patricia fails, and the consequence is that she ends up accidentally opening this closet that allows the project's official mascot, a capuchin monkey, to escape and start running around causing minor chaos. The big surprise is that Patricia's professional rival, the reckless but striking Benji, is part of the American team. So they glare at each other and make snide comments. We check with the other side of the base, and they tell us that the reactor that powers the base is leaking radiation, and that's what's mutating the surrounding marine life. They ask us to lock it down and warn us about the giant mutated shark that's guarding it. So we spend a few minutes describing and rolling for some sort of advantage during our final press to solve the problem of the reactor. I use my spear gun to harpoon the shark with a chain to restrict its movement. Patricia powers up her water jets on her suit to allow for increased mobility and get Getting to the reactor, which is on a shelf under the base proper. The captain miserably fails to prevent Benji from escaping, and he leaves us to our fate. So, advantages in hand, we go ahead to tackle the battle phase. In this case, that's getting the reactor locked down without getting eaten by this huge shark. In the battle phase, there's an objective that you can take on, or you can use your role to mitigate some otherwise guaranteed consequence of the battle that'll happen whether you win or lose. In the case of Aegon, it might be no matter how the battle goes, the village is going to get burned down. Something like that. In this case, Mikhail offered the destruction of the base as a consequence. So the captain, rather than take on the objective with us, decided to try to prevent that consequence instead of tackling the reactor as well. So that's a thing you can do in the system, which is you can go after the main objective of the battle, or you can take one of those preset conditions and try and keep it from happening. So we roll out, and Patricia succeeds. The reactor is covered in shielding and safe. The captain succeeds, distracting the shark and saving the base. But I fail, intercepted by that earlier giant squid as it envelops me in a thick cloud of ink. But that's okay, because we got great pictures of everything, and our final roll to wrap the session goes well, with all of us succeeding, which means we get the crew back to the surface, as well as capture some amazing pictures of everything that happened, and we free the shark to go swim off, you know, and eat its fill at the bottom of the ocean. So, kind of happy endings all around. In this case, for our closing situation for this game, it was mission accomplished. We did great. Every session of this particular Paragon playset is meant to stand alone. It's meant to be an expedition. So we concluded with this particular expedition complete. In this playset, it's actually written into the game that a year or more takes place between missions, which is to say between our play sessions in game terms. So next time... We'll use some pick lists that are included in the game to help narrate what happened in the intervening time period before we take on our next Odyssey. So my favorite moment from a PC is when Emma, who was playing Patricia, introduced that monkey like just out of the blue for no other reason than it was a very cool 1960s thing to happen in that moment it's the kind of thing that you could see happening in black and white they open a closet and there's a monkey there for no reason other than just somebody thought it would be fun to have a monkey in the show it wasn't written into the snare or anything it wasn't something that you know mikhail had in his prep she just dropped it into the game to make things more delightfully chaotic and you know this monkey in the lab at the bottom of the sea and it was delightful my favorite moment from our GM, and this is a little silly. I mean, it isn't like a rules thing, but when Mikhail got to name one of the features of our exploratory ship in stereotypical Scandinavian fashion, he insisted that we had a sauna on board. So we added that to the map of the ship. It was one of the options on the pick list, but you know, he didn't pick helicopter. He didn't pick computer room. He wanted to make sure that we knew we had a sauna on the ship. So he added that on. It didn't come into play this session, but I can't wait to see how we utilize it because it's there, which means we will. And actually, it tells us a lot about that ship 
and what kind of crew we are that our oceanographic research vessel actually has a sauna on board. So it's going to be fun to see how that rattles out and what that's going to mean in our future sessions. Something I noticed about the game, and in particular this session, this is my second Paragon playset that I've played. I've not actually played Aegon itself, the original game that the Paragon system was developed for, but I have played another playset called Ares Ascendant. That's by Dan Brown. It's about colonizing Mars, and it's colonizing Mars in a sort of Kim Stanley Robinson harder SF sort of way, as opposed to being like, you know, like an Edgar Rice Burroughs, Pulp Barsoom kind of thing or anything like that. It's, you know, it's straightforward SF. It's like uh, The Martian or something like that. So, I have familiarity with the system. We played the three sessions of it, I think, but nothing like mastery. So it was kind of a humbling experience to be learning a new system as the GM was too, and to have it be different enough than other systems I've played that was kind of taken off guard. Like if you put a new PBTA game in front of me, I played enough other PBTA games that I just kind of have to pick out the couple of ways that it's different and everything else is comfortable and I'm fine. And I think I was maybe expecting that I was going to be able to waltz through this, but I absolutely was not able to. And in this case, I was particularly struck by the very specific order this system uses to handle narration, roles, and resolution. So most typical RPGs that we play, whether they're indie or trad, are focused on individual direct action with whatever teamwork mechanics they have either bolted on or treated as ancillary, like a thing that you can do in certain situations, but not integral to the game. But in Paragon, it's the entire point of the system. So the usual turn-taking that all role players are used to doesn't quite work in a Paragon game. We actually struggled with this during the game because we are so in the habit of player A narrates, rolls, and resolves, then player B narrates, roles and resolves, and then player C, etc., that we lost track of the fact that the system explicitly calls on you to have, basically the GM sets the difficulty, then the players each build their little dice pool in turn by calling out the attributes that the dice represent. One might be your name, one might be your specialty, one might be a piece of gear that you're using, etc., etc. But, and this is the important part, no one rolls until everyone has declared then all of the players roll at once and you see who prevailed and who didn't. If even one player prevails, the heroes as a group overcome the obstacle, whatever the challenge is. Anyone who fails the roll suffers an individual consequence as a result. If none of you prevail, then a wider narrative consequence comes to pass in addition to whatever individual pain you experience. As much fun as the game was, and I do love all the people that I'm playing with, so it was definitely fun, there were times when it felt like being the third person to roll was kind of superfluous because we already knew the outcome because we weren't doing it in the right order. So now that I've had a chance to go back over the rules more carefully and read exactly how the procedure is supposed to work, I'm really eager to see how doing it exactly right will change that feeling of suspense attached to outcome that lagged a little at times in this particular session. It was a great illustration that it is important to make sure that you fully understand and follow a game's procedure, especially if you're as guilty as I am of declaring that you'll just pick it up as you go because you've played a ton of games. And that did not actually really work in this point. And I did actually need to go back and read the rules. So score one for RTFM with this one, I guess. So that's it for this week. You can follow me on Twitter at Jim Likes Games, which is also the name of my YouTube channel, where I've compiled hundreds of hours of actual play tabletop RPG videos. Purchase game stuff I've written at my itch.io page under Jim Likes Games, and look for me at conventions working with my friends at Indie Press Revolution. Finally, listen for me on other shows in the Curmudgeons and Dragons family of gaming podcasts. If you like what I'm doing here, please rate and review the show and tell your other gamer friends about it. This episode was written and voiced by me, Jim Crocker, and produced by Jason Protizo. That's it for this week, so if you'll excuse me, I am going to play another game. Thank you for listening to Commudgeons and Dragons. Please share this with your favorite adventurers. Leave a review on Apple and follow us on social media. All links can be found at curmudgeonsanddragons.com. Practice safe adventuring, my friends. 
This has been a JTP Audio Podcast. Thanks for listening.